have actually been spending 20 years doing multiple things, multiple things around this field. I've been, I've been, been doing Dex exclusively now for really five years. years. I'd like to think I'm a bit of an expert, an expert, an expert and before, before that I did Dex as well. Now but it's exclusive. I've got an MBA, I've got an MBA from London business, 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 business School. School. I just say this because I've studied obviously business business management and everything that goes with it. with it. Dex, Dex, please be back to me about businesses and we can have analysing them. Uh, what, uh, else? what else? The teachings that you have today, today come from, come from multiple, multiple areas. areas. Right. Right. So, so my teachings, so my teachings take into consideration, consideration everything that's business, 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 business school, school, everything that's taught by, by biggest, the biggest teachers, teachers, experts, experts, everything that's been taught by investors, by, by, by my personal friends, which are also, also angel. Also angel. Some of the 15 most important questions are the following. Are you from a promising industry? Right. Are there existing challenges? Is there an inspiring opportunity within this industry and these challenges? Can you positively capitalize as and make money from it? Is your solution valid? Does it have anything unique to it? Does it have a proven methodology? Strong marketing? Can you scale it? Can you really grow? Is your strategy focused? Right, I clearly can't spell there, but I am trying to see, do you have foreseeable success? Are your costs acceptable? Are we talking about exciting returns? And finally, is the risk manageable? This is literally the series of questions that are running through an investor's mind as they're looking towards your venture. This is what they want to know. Sometimes more, sometimes a bit less, but these are the questions that are going to lead them to, does your venture make sense? Is it worthy? So in the last session, we covered the market, the opportunity, and how that went into your solution. If you've missed it, make sure that you know you have a look at it when you've got a chance. Which is why in this particular one, we're going to move on. Now, just one last bit about the narrative. Every story has a beginning and an end. Your pitch deck is a story in itself, right? It must be a story. Too often you see slide, 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 disjointed. If you create a story for your investors, it's much easier for them to run through it. One slide literally needs to go into the next and go into the next, so that it makes sense to the mind. So your deck starts with what? What are we talking about, right? What is the industry? And then it goes into the why. Why are you presenting this to me now? Why is it exciting? It then needs to slide into the who. Okay, so who's gonna use this? Well, who is this for? And it's gonna move on to the how. All right, how do we achieve this? Only through creating this consistent narrative 
in your pitch deck, this consistent story, do you really grab your investor and keep them going throughout? Why? Because the brain, the way it functions, it needs structure. It needs for one thing to lead to another so that it can make sense of it and remember it. One of the reasons that so many pitch decks get forgotten is because it's just slides with random information and it didn't form a chain. And as it didn't form a chain, it didn't set in the investor's mind. So please remember to build that chain with your deck. This is so important. And I was trying to say that before we went and went into the market date on the problem, the opportunity why now, and we spoke about the offer and the solution. Today, we go again deeper into the offer or your solution, the MVP and your customer segment. So to start, when we're talking about the offer, your solution, in other words, to a market problem that we will have presented before, it can be a product or a service. We know that. Your product at the end of the day is always a solution, no matter what it is, even if it's a luxury. Luxury is a solution to life, right? Life is difficult, life is challenging. Bring me happiness, it's a solution to difficult life, right? So no matter what, you are solving a problem. If the workplace is inefficient and you're helping, you're solving for a problem, you're making it more efficient. If your solution is a product to be enjoyed, again, no matter what, you're solving, you're solving a product. So I know a lot of people talk about, you know, luxury versus necessity. Whatever you are, you are solving a problem. And so it's so important to be able to present this problem to your investor and say, look, this is what I'm solving. Because whenever human beings have problems, they want them solved. It's the way we are born. It's the way our, our brain functions. So the previous session was all about the problem. Now, keeping in mind that I imagine you've all worked out your problems, when we go into the solution, what we're doing is we're saying, right, I've already explained to you the problem within the market. Here's a solution I've put forward. And there's two sides to the solution. First is the obvious, like customers are dying for this or customers need this, so we've created this. But what you're also saying to the investors, because customers have a need or want for this, we can make money off it. That's what the investor wants to know. That's why they need the problem. So you make sure you have the problem first and then you say, this is why they are looking for a solution and this is my solution. So your solution really needs to be tied up with a previous slide that speaks of the problem. Remember that, tied up all too often. I see solutions, we do this and this and this and this. There was no problems before that. But by presenting the problem and then the solution, you are anchoring the investor into the, ah, this is why it makes sense in the market, right? Now I get you. It goes deeper into the psychology. Now, obviously, with a service, I, I see it presented in many different ways, but what we need to remember here is, okay, we need to show what that product or service is. Really, really clear. And if it's a product, I want to see a really clear picture. If it's a service, I want to see a clear description, but please make it short, get to the point. Also want to see, ideally, how right, it's fixing a previous problem. So one of the things you can do in your deck is you can say, slow response, you know, uh, arrow, so and such product. Um, for those seeking luxuries, arrow, da 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 da. Moving on. Does it not want to move on? Here we go. Showcasing your benefits. Now, there's two ways to do this. If you can truly get to the point with what you are offering in just one word, and there's space on your slide for also the benefits, and you can say, we offer. No, um, somebody give me a product idea, please. What do you do? What do you offer? Uh, Patient-specific medical devices. Patient-specific medical devices. Okay, that's a mouthful. That's going to take some explanation. So the best thing is to do, you have your solution here on one slide, right, with the lines of what you're doing, and then you're going to go into the next one, and you're going to explain what those benefits are. Right? So, so the first one is, let's say, a device for a heart, maybe? Cardiac? Bones, bones, bones yeah. right, okay. And you give, an, you give an image of what it looks like, right? This is our product, this is what it looks like. You then go to the second slide and you really dive deep into the benefits of this. Separate them, let there be clarity, because the likelihood is you have more than one product, more than one service. 
And so if you were to say everything you do and all of the services on, on one slide, it's, it's too much. And remember, you want to sink in the information slowly into the investor's brain. Right? It's a trickle down to forming a chain. So when we come to the benefits, what we've got to speak about, obviously, and this is when we often talk about the slide, which is a unique value proposition. You know, Many people might have the same service, but what makes them truly unique is your benefits. We want to talk about, obviously, not the product or service. We want to talk about the benefit. We want to talk about what it brings. We want to br talk about the effects of it. Okay, so forgive me, this needs to be corrected. I really, it's important to understand the difference between the solution and the benefits. All too often, people mix these together or they try to sell the benefits before they sell the solution. And that creates a mix up. So make sure you separate them. So we've got the service at the center and then each benefit that comes from it. Another reason why it's important, I would say, to separate the solution from the benefit is, as you can see here, each solution creates a new revenue stream, right? Now, you might be a company that just has one solution and it's all about the benefits, that's absolutely fine. And then you can differentiate yourself with the level of benefits, you know, your basic product, your mid-level, etc. But for the rest of you, you want to clarify. You've got this solution, that solution, that solution. Each one is a revenue stream, which over time, you will be able to add to. You know, it might be that in a year's time you have an extra two or an extra three. So you want to clarify them for your revenue stream. But at the end of the day, your benefits are what affect the value, the price, and the competitiveness of each one of these products. And this will matter later, and I'll show you how. Here we've got our product, right? Quite obvious. And then we speak about the, how the solution forms part of the revenue. Well, the more benefits your product holds, right, the more you can increase your margins. And so it's particularly useful to separate them because sometimes an investor will see a product that they feel that is badly priced, right, or is not quite unique or something else. You want to show exactly how it's been built so that they can also see how that product could change over time how it could potentially become um, bringing more revenue, right? You could show how you can offer it to different segmentations just by playing with the benefits. Right, let's talk about some examples of the solution and why solution and benefits need to be differentiated, okay? So I'm taking myself as an example here I'm not going into all of the solution and all the benefits because we want to make it nice and simple. Right, so the problem here, which is why I started my business, is that pitch decks are difficult. Right, they're difficult, they're time consuming, they're confusing, it's a pain. I remember the first time I tried to do a pitch deck before I was an expert, I was literally crying within two hours. The second thing is, it needs financial information. How many people here can literally value their own company? Right? How many people have what it takes to create a valuation model, a forecast, speak about revenue and internal returns and all of that? It requires backing documents. Again, how many people have the time or the capacity to write a full business plan for due diligence purposes? You know. And finally, it needs an understanding of business, finance, investment, marketing, a bunch of stuff. It is difficult, it is overwhelming, it is time consuming. This is a problem. My solution is I sell pitch decks, right? I create forecasts and valuations, create business plans, right? So you can do all the backup documents. And I do professional coaching to help people through to get them there, the mindset, and all of these things. Now, those are my solutions which I would present. And then comes the benefits of saving you time, doing all the hard work for you, building all of these things increasing your chances of raising and preparing you for investors. It is important that you differentiate each one and that you present them individually as opposed to mixing, which I see all too often, because each one speaks of something differently. This is how I've capitalized on the market. Great. This is how I differentiate myself and I charge what I choose to charge. Let's talk about comparison. 
A lot of people think, how do we compare? A lot of people don't even like comparing themselves in the market or in their debt because it makes them nervous to show investors who else is there, to show investors that maybe somebody else could get their business. But investors need to know. And if you don't present this, investors are going to think, mm, either you're hiding the competition right, because you're weak, or you're literally, forgive my language, too stupid to know who you're up against, which I think is even worse. Well, actually, I don't know, liar or stupid, both of that. Right? So don't let them think badly of you. Have the strength and the courage to present your competition. And actually, presenting your competition is what's going to differentiate yourself. It's going to give you strength if you do it in the right way. It's so important. You know, market comparison defines the differences in order to prove how your offer stands out and ranks itself within the market, right? You need to compare your products, all your services in terms of short and long-term benefits. Price and payment structure. Usability and accessibility. Quality and quantity time management and savings. So often I see decks that are missing some of these points, these relevant points that really can take you up there. You might have a service that is just like somebody else's and you're like, oh, we don't really differentiate ourselves. And all you could have thought of is, what if we do a payment scheme that nobody else offers, right? What if we, maybe in short term it's the same, but in long term we create benefits that nobody else offers? Please think of every single one of these. They all matter. There's always a way to differentiate yourself from the competition, no matter how busy the market is. Right. I don't know if I did it this way. Now, a great way of creating uh, a comparison is with a table. Guys, I absolutely love it, and most importantly, forget about me, investors love it when they've got a nice visual that makes it so easy to see names, see services, see benefits. A table is fantastic because you can have, you know, competitors and alternatives. And it's like, it's a quick visual of, oh, how many ticks, how many things, how do you compare? And it makes you look great because you've always got that box with all the ticks. It's the easiest way for investors to get that information. And even though here, you know, you've got another five competitors there, does it make you look any less? No, on the contrary, the fact that you are able to tick every box is amazing. It's a winning matter. It's exactly what investors want to see. So don't be afraid. Put those investors, sorry, if those investors, put those competitors forward. Have at least three, if not four. And if you don't have those competitors, you need to put alternatives. And actually, alternatives are so important as well. They also go to make you look fabulous. I'll tell you why. But before I do, I'm just going to bring together another comparison chart. Sometimes you're in a market that is really, really saturated, and there's very few ways to differentiate yourself to a point where all that's left is perhaps pricing, technology, or how long your brand's been around. If you are limited, if you cannot have the previous table and say that, oh, look, we have all of these, Fine. Go to what makes you really special. All right. Position yourself here and say, look, we're modern and we're cheaper. Or we're known for, you know, we're in the luxury range. Or, but put one of these. Showcase the comparison. Do not be afraid. Right. I'm going to talk more about the alternatives now in a second, but Here's the thing, this is, this is trying to write down, again, not all the information is there, because the point is we want to go quickly through this. Looking at competitors and alternatives, and why alternatives matter. One of the things I always ask my, um, my clients is, okay, who are your competitors, number one? What are the alternatives? Now, I always say, oh, we, we don't really have any competitors, nobody quite does what we do. Doesn't matter. Who's the closest one to you? And if you really, there's nobody in the entire market that does what you do, what are the alternatives? Why? Because when you present the alternatives, you can show the clients where the weaknesses lie. So with pitch decks, right? You say, I do pitch deck content, and design, and the forecasting, and the plans, and the coaching. If you go to a consultancy, right, they're my closest competitors. But they don't really do pitch deck design. 
I don't know if anybody's ever dealt with a consultancy, the documents you get from there, the pitch decks, firstly, it's about 30 slides <coughs> long, right? So it's really, really long. And then there's no prettiness there. It's just, you know, consultancies. It's bum, bum, bum. Here's the information. Here's the analysis. Of the it, it misses that, that element which makes your deck more to the point. It's more of a narrative. It's more a story. And it's easier to read through. They do forecast evaluations. They're fantastic. They do business plans, great. But they're not going to sit and coach you. That's not what consultancies do. So already, if I present my, my competitors, I can say, look, I have more services for my clients, which I desperately need. And this brings about more benefits. If I add the alternative to my product, which what is the alternative? Somebody can go on, let's say, Fiverr and say, right, I want to pitch content. It's unlikely you'll get somebody who can write the content and do the design. Very likely, but maybe you have somebody who can do both individually. You get the person who does the content and the design. This is not going to be somebody who can do your financial side. They're not going to be able to do the forecast and valuation. That takes a professional modeler with a lot of experience. You get your professional modeler and experience. That's the second person. They're not going to be able to do your business plan. So now you need a third person. You get all these three guys, and then you want a professional coach. Okay, none of these people are going to be a coach. So now you've had to add another person. Okay, this is fantastic. By presenting the investors with the alternatives out there, I've been able to prove that my one little company has so many benefits. So I'm no longer afraid of the competition, right? Cheaper, better, more services. And I'm certainly not afraid of my alternatives. So. What I'm saying to you is don't be afraid. Put out there what exists. Show to them why no matter what the case is, whether it's a direct competitor or alternative, you're better. Now, every investor is slightly different. We all know that. We're all individuals. We all have our own needs. And we're done now in terms of our three main slides. But I want you to have this takeaway. When you go to your investor, you want to make it personal. Personal to him personal to her. The best way to do that is by researching them. Right? And you want to know, how long has this investor been in business for? Where has his or her deal been so far? Is there an industry they like more than another? Right? You want an investor who hopefully invests specifically in your industry, right? because you're going to be more exciting to them. You want to learn about who they've invested in. Look up, like, what are the companies? What stage were they at? If they've got a LinkedIn presence, if they've got an Instagram, great. Go. Go read anything you can read about them. Look at their posts. Understand them as a human being so you can get a feel for them. Don't be afraid to like ask, you know, check your network, go on LinkedIn. Who knows this investor? Is there somebody who you're connected to who you could speak and say, can you tell me a little bit more about this investor? And also, most importantly, if they're right for you, could you introduce me? Right? Read up as much as you can. If you can, and you're going to present to them, perhaps connect and say, hey, listen, I know you're an investor. I have some questions. Right? Start by researching them before you present anything to them. Get into their mindset. Get to know what they want. And when you're like, I get you, and I know my solution's good for you, then go and present to them. But do that homework. Now, does anybody have any questions? Um, after you, sorry, my name's Peter. Nice to meet you, Peter. Uh, after you do the research about the investors, which is the right time to tell them during your presentation that they can do the research about them? Or after you're allowed to do it? You are allowed to do it. And, and I want you to think about it. Put yourself in, in their shoes. If somebody comes up to you and says, you know, I've researched all about you. I'm just enthralled by like all the deals that you've made. I think it's fantastic. You know, you clearly have your your eye on the ball. Like you clearly know the places to invest in. It's a compliment. It's a compliment if you've quite studied somebody and if you think, oh wow. So yeah, you can say, look, I've I've done my research. I read all about you. I just think you're a fantastic investor, and I'd love to pitch my venture to you. You can say that. Sure. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's like the lead part of the investment. Is it okay for you 
So let's say there's a whole group and you've done your research on that person. As long as it's research kind of like on the business side and you're not stalking them, are they married, do they have kids, where you live, as long as it's not that kind of personal and it's more about, okay, what have they done in their career and who have they invested in, then that's fine because you're researching on the business side, you're researching to understand them. And again, imagine you're having this conversation, which you don't have to go up to them, but if you say, look, I have researched all of your acquisitions. It's not a bad thing. It's a compliment, right? I've learned so much about your portfolio. It's not a bad thing. And the truth is, investors, just like any professional, want people who take the time to research. It's important to showcase that mindset of, yeah, I do my homework before I get into anything. So, we'll go for it. You're welcome. Anybody else? Go ahead. Um, so Absolutely. So every story is, is slightly different. Right? So if you've got kind of a brand new venture in a brand new market, you want to speak about the market first to help anchor the investor into why this market makes sense, why a new venture there makes sense, because there's opportunity. If you're an existing business that you've been running for quite a while and you've been successful, you're actually going to change that more and you're going to anchor them into the start of why you because you've been so successful for such a long time, you can be trusted. If you're an entrepreneur who has won awards, who's done this before, then you're gonna start, you anchor them with yourself, your achievements. So yes, you can absolutely change a narrative. And the most important thing is thinking, how am I going to anchor them? What do I anchor them to? And that has to be on where there's the greatest potential. Is it a problem in the market? You know. Sorry for this horrible example, but 100 people are starving. I've got a solution, right? Is it an opportunity? Um, what can I say? There's a whole new Bitcoin that's coming about, or the rules are changing, and I'm about to take advantage of it. Is it yourself? I'm an award-winning entrepreneur, and I'm about to set up the next unicorn. You know, find what is the most exciting thing to anchor your investor on and go from there. But use a formula at the end of the day, if we go back at the beginning. What, why, who, how? That what can be you, it can be the problem, it can be the opportunity, it can be anything. But that's your anchor. What? What are we talking about? It might be that you have just created the most incredible technology and you start from there. Because often I think to myself, I'll check my data a lot this week. I, I remember what percentage of chance people want to do things going past day 20. Because you, you don't get that many responses most of the time, especially if you're sending it to a big chain of financial or anything. So venture capital firm or something. So sometimes I wonder if you should start with something that's just such to them that actually, because they're seeing some decks, they don't just go, oh, here's another one to start with, but rather than here's this group and there's a, see what I mean? But that's, that's the whole point. You've got to find what is the most important thing is in your deck. Agreed. Again, what is it? Is it the opportunity? Is it the solution? Is it you? What is it? At the end of the day, what are investors looking at? They're looking for an opportunity that they can capitalize on. So you need to anchor them with something really, really strong, right? Years ago, they used to say, oh, you, it, it needs to be a story, make it personal, make it emotional. No, no, that's no longer the case. Now it's really much more cold and calculative just because so many decks, so many ventures have come about. So you need to, yeah, anchor them with a wow, but a quantifiable wow. And you need to think, where is that the greatest number coming from? You know, it, and in each one of you is different. As I said, it, it might be any one of those categories. As long as you link the most important thing and like, look, 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 this is what you need to see. This is like incredible. Okay, now look, this is how we are going to take advantage of it. This is where the money's gonna come from. 
right? And this is how what what the products are that I capitalize, okay? And this is why our products are going to be fantastic because eventually most people are going to find do this, but ours are going to be fantastic this way. And now look, this is how we're going to compare to the alternatives of the comparison. Again, it's the same chain, no matter what you start with. It needs to be that chain. Anyone else? Mm. Oh, no, don't worry. Yeah, it's more than a good show. I can understand how you come to that conclusion, and it's really, really good. So the approach here is firstly, psychologically, how do you present what you're doing to the investor in a way that answers all his or her questions? Because your product has to be great. You're right, if you can't sell it to your end users, forget about the investor. That's your basic thing. If nobody's gonna buy it, Investors are not. But why is it not just a brochure? Because it goes beyond there. You could have a great product that everybody is buying, and it still won't be enough. Why? Because investors want to make sure that, wait a second, okay, you're selling, you're doing this, you're selling this. Um, does, do you still get revenue? You can have sales without growing what's in your bank account. You can do well, but if you don't have a growth, if you don't have the possibility to scale up, then what the investor gives you today, they're not gonna get a return on. So they need to know that, okay, great, your product is fantastic, people are buying it, they're liking it. But they need to know that you've done it in such a way that you are not just making ends meet, you're getting more than that. And they need to know that it's not just about today, today you're fantastic and you're selling and everybody loves it. But how are you gonna stay relevant? The investor know, needs to know that you have a plan, a strategy and a process that's gonna keep you successful for at least the next three years. They need to know also that this isn't just luck. Sometimes you sell the right product at the right time and everybody falls on, on top of it, yay, nobody's done this before. But you don't survive past a year or two. That's why it's more than a brochure. It's that setup, and you know, it's all about money, absolutely. But every single one of this, and this is what we're going to do in another class, every single one of these slides is actually going to present a value, right, to your investors. We're going to talk about quantifiable data and how you place it every single time to prove that every single one of this talks about the bottom line and why investors will see a return. Does that help answer it? Um, I also think in the first few decades, That's right, so it's very different if, let's say, you're still at the beginning um, and you're raising to an angel investor versus a venture capitalist. And again, this is why you need to think of the mindset. How is the mindset of an angel investor different from the venture capitalist? When at the venture level, all right, now it's not just like, is the business viable, can it grow? No, no, then it's much deeper in the numbers. All right, what are we talking about, right? What's a button line? How can we make it more efficient? How can we take it to the next level? How can we up it, grow it? You know, how can we open more doors for it? So that's why, you know, pre-seed, seed, series A versus series B, it's a completely different story. And then we'd be talking about another deck narrative. Uh, 
It's, it's used in the sense that no matter what you present at the end of the day, you need to have a story. As I said, one slide needs to link into the other. Why? Because our brains make sense of stories. But it's no longer what it used to be in a few years ago. All you had to do is present something that grabbed people's emotions. All right, so if you spoke of a problem of, you know, all these people are starving, or all these people are having so much difficulties, or, you know, uh, people are clamoring, back then, that was what got people. But since then, the world has become harder, tougher, more analytical. You have way more investors, and you have way more in potential investments. So we've gone from stories to gone much deeper into, really, okay, this is fun, but are you viable? Are you really gonna make money? How much are we talking about? So we've gone beyond those simple stories that we used to have just a few years ago. So different investors believe in different departments, okay? Um, yes, you have a lot of investors who want just technology. It has to be technology, it has to be new, it has to be owned by you and, and the thing. But you still have a lot of investors who are interested in products, in services. And the best thing you can do is firstly do your research on LinkedIn, right? Get a list of names, look at what they're investing in. There's a lot of investor group, you know, you can talk to the investor group um, angel investors, you can literally message and call them up and you can say, do you have anybody who's interested in this particular field or who could I speak to? You know, look around, talk around. There are different interests. There's some investors who are so tired of the competition, let's say, in fintech that they will no longer go there. Right? It's still, you still have a broad interest. Yes, there will always be the top industries right? and, and I don't want to report now on who is the top industries, but you have dozens who, you know, dozens of thousands or whatever people across uh, the, the UAE and the GCSC, et cetera, who go beyond that, who are willing to, to invest in, in sometimes even rare industries. So don't be afraid to, to develop whatever your solution is and then go speak to people, find people who might be linked to what you do. Uh, I have a follow-up to the initial question. Sure. Um, again, we're going on a mindset that we used to have for a long time. If you tell a great story and if it's really engaging, it'll grab people's emotions and we are emotional human beings, so we judge by how we feel. We've, we've really gone, again, we've gone beyond that. A story is great, but think about it yourself, all right? We are all investors at the end of the day. We, we really are. Every time we go shopping, we invest our money into goods, right? If you're buying skin products, you've got a budget and you're literally judging which one of these creams makes sense for me. If you're into sports and, and you're buying sneakers, again, you're looking around, which one makes sense? We are all investors. So how many of you here have bought something because they had a catchy story? Anyone? Any? Uh, I mean, realistically, I think I have. Okay. Sort of. um. Now, when have you bought something because it had a catchy story? There, there is something, but think about it. When, when did it matter? For me, on the things that mattered to me, for example. So, like, let's say, for example, I went out the other day and I bought a, a football. I don't even watch football, but I watched. I bought a football jersey because it was made out of plastic that was that came out of the sea. You know, so it was a cool story for me. It was like something that was good in terms of sustainability. So I said, you know, I'm going to buy it to support. So I have done that before in the past, but rarely. Yeah. That's not a story, though. You okay. bought into a benefit. It was sold as a story, but actually what they sold you is a benefit. And the benefit is you're helping out the planet. Mm -hmm. By taking this decision, you're doing something good for every single life on the planet, on the planet itself. 
So that's why don't mistake benefits for a story. Really, when you think of who's bought for story, right? Imagine, you know, nothing about me, my background, or what I do. But I'm like, hey guys, I'm super cool. I'm like the coolest person in the world, and I'm really nice. Oh, and and I've got this situation, and it's a bit sad, but I'm I'm full of courage, and blah 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 blah. Now come get my service. No. Especially if this is on a professional level, where we're talking about a lot of money, and the more money we're talking about, the kind of more serious. We're talking about. Actually, I shouldn't even say that. When you've got an angel investor, it might not be millions, but it, you know what? Every dirham matters. It's not that story that's going to lock them in of why you did what you did. The story at play here is why what you're selling makes sense. Why you can be trusted as an entrepreneur to work with this money. So. That idea that we had, tell a cool story, everybody will remember you, everybody will love you. Everybody, maybe if you're on a crowdfunding platform, yeah, it'll help you. But the rest of it comes down to your benefits and the value created by those benefits. Okay. In your domain? So key thing here is showing how your product isn't just gonna capitalize today, but it's gonna capitalize it on the long term. Right, there's been a lot of companies that have done really, really well for a couple of years and then they've just, right? So you wanna show that you have a solution that can keep going. And you wanna show like again and again and again, when I've asked investors, what's the most important thing to you? Right? Um, one of the points that keeps coming every time is, Fixing a problem, right? It's number one. If you've got if you've got a solution to a problem, then people will naturally want to spell on it. Number two, scalability. I hear this again and again, and especially within this market, they want something scalable. So something that isn't just going to sell here in Dubai, but that can go to the whole of the UAE, then that can go to the whole of the GCSE, and that, that can go beyond. They want to see that you've got a solution which was just maybe a little bit more to the marketing, but not the solution itself. Maybe a little bit more to salaries. It can go global. This is really important to local investors. In strategy, they want to see that you guys are focused and you know exactly what you're doing, not just today, but how you're going to grow over the years. Okay. The investors, where do you find your investors? What I would say is, uh, the great thing is nowadays we've got websites that tell you about like all the investor groups, all the, the websites, all of this. Go online, you'll get an entire list. Um, I do have a list somewhere, I can try and send it to you guys, but it's, it's all up there on the internet. You always have one or two brilliant people who've taken the time to do all of that research for you. And then of course, on top of that, you have individuals on LinkedIn, but if you go to individuals, I would say try not to go straight to them and bombard them see if you're connected to them through anybody else on Instagram and if you can get that introduction. Otherwise, look for groups. They are fantastic. And the best thing about groups is you tell them what it is that they do and they will themselves do the work and say, well, here are the following individuals who could be interested. You good? Mm -hmm. So now that you've like, you can submit your pitch decks online to the investor mm -hmm. website or whatever. That's right. So something significantly changed within that time span. So uh, how will you uh, like suggest to counter that? You actually use that to your benefit, right? Let's say they get back to you, oh, I've seen your thing and it's changed. Well, what you do is you don't go, oh, I'm sorry, like uh, numbers have changed now, this and that. You're like, it's great. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you saw my pitch deck. Can we perhaps meet so I can update you on the changes? Use that as a chance to, to talk, to connect. Anybody else? Okay. The team, my particular team. No, so what we do, um, 
the way I'm doing it for you today is because a pitch deck has quite a few slides and it's got quite a few subjects today, I've just taken you through like literally the, the three main slides that we're talking about, your solution, the benefits and the comparison. And I've spoken to you a little bit about myself as opposed to the whole team because all I've done here is what am I trying to anchor to you? Why don't we even start when we're doing a seminar by who we are? Because I'm trying to prove to you that guys, I know what I'm talking about. I actually have the relevant experience and education to be able to talk about the subject. If you want to know about my team, I can give you the website, which is actually here. I can introduce them or we can message anything you like. Okay. Or do you mean in the setup, forgive me, this is probably what you were talking about. Oh, let's take it. Do you mean in the solutions or the slides that you can present? You meant this one? Okay, so just for me, personally. I know I just didn't see that it might interest you guys to know who the team is, but no, I'm a good boy. Hey. You good? Well, I think those are all the questions online as well, and I see anybody else has questions, let me know. Thank right. you so much, Alexandra. My pleasure. It's been nice meeting you all. If you've got any questions, don't be shy. You can find me on LinkedIn and, and message me there. Okay, guys, have an amazing